What's up guys, it's Dull Matter here, and today we are going to be reacting to another extra history video. So this one is His Monstrous Father, Frederick the Great, Part 1. So uh, obviously this is a series on Frederick the Great, starting with his father. And um, yeah, I think, I think this is a good place to start, right? Because, a lot, you know, Frederick the Great is one of the many leaders who has the great title, another being Alexander, who their father did a lot of the legwork for him, right? When it came to, like, building up the army and stuff like that, similar to Alexander. Uh, but also his father was quite the monstrous man when it came to how he treated his son. I was I was actually not aware of this until a recent video we reacted to. I was you know, well aware of his father, Frederick William. I was well aware of him. I wasn't really aware of the, how their relationship was, though. I just knew his father was, like, highly militaristic. He was pretty flamboyant as a youngster and then became highly militaristic, and I knew a lot of that had to do with his father's death. Uh, but I wasn't well aware of, like, how it was in relation to his father treating him until we had watched that other video, uh, which I found really interesting. But anyway, link to the original down below, and let's jump into it. Fortress of Kustrin, Brandenburg, November 6th, 1730. Frederick, crown oh, prince yeah, yeah. of Brandenburg, Prussia, looks through this the bars his of father his kills cell his best windows friend. as soldiers lead his companion, Hans Hermann von Kata, to the Mound of Sand. Kata is more than his friend. He's the 18-year-old Frederick's confidant, his protector, and some say his lover. And he had tried to save Frederick from his father, the king of Prussia. And Kata would pay. Please forgive me, dear Kata, Frederick yells in French, the language they both prefer. In God's name. Okay, maybe they, you know, I can see why people thought they, they were, you know, maybe lovers. They're speaking French to each other. <laughs> Just gotta, like, you know, stick that in there, stick it in the French. But, um, yeah, so, so this is kind of... It's true, but he's kind of like glossing over the some of the stuff here that I find uh, I think should be really important. His friend here, von Kata, had tried to convince Frederick not to leave, but then when Frederick decided, you know, basically when he found realized he couldn't convince Frederick not to leave, he decided to help him leave. Uh, and a lot of this was just as punishment for Frederick, because from my understanding, his father knew this, but basically just wanted to. You know, kind of blamed him, but probably didn't actually believe that he was the reason, and basically just wanted to punish his son to get his son in line. Name, forgive me. There's nothing to forgive, Kata answers in the same language. I die for you with joy in my heart. The headsman steps up, revealing his axe. Frederick doesn't want to watch, but two soldiers, acting on his father's orders, grab hold of him and press his face to the bars. He screams, he fights, the axe raises over Kata's bare neck, and mercifully, the boy who would become Prussia's greatest king faints before he sees it fall. Do, 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 do. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for continuing to help us bring history to the table. Hey everyone, as you can probably tell already, Frederick the Great's childhood was a horror show of abuse and homophobic bullying by his father. So with today's episode, viewer discretion is advised. Frederick the Great is one of the most dynamic monarchs of the 18th century. Inheriting a fractured piece of the Holy Roman Empire, a place so minor, its monarch was called King in Prussia rather than King of Prussia. He so that had nothing to do with... Okay, Prussia at this point, well, I guess it was Brandenburg Prussia at this point, was definitely not minor. It was like way on its ascendancy, right? It was already, you know, and uh, his father was a lot of the reason for this. Um, not entirely, there was, you know, people in charge before that they were also heavily involved. Um, but, pr like, they were rapidly on the ascendancy for, from this point. The reason it was king in Prussia was because of the way the Holy Roman was, Empire was structured. He, he couldn't be king of Brandenburg, Prussia, because the Brandenburg was part of the Holy Roman Empire. Prussia, however, was not part of the Holy Roman Empire, even though it was technically part of the same state as Brandenburg, Prussia. Right? This has a lot to do with, like, you know, the Holy Roman Empire being like very much this like leftover remnant of feudalism that still existed until the, the you know Prussia conquered it. Um, well, well, actually, until Napoleon conquered it and dissolved it, uh, and then you know Prussia would conquer the leftover states. But anyway, Pr Prussia was a powerhouse at this point. That's why he was able to be considered king in Prussia because he was so powerful. Uh, it, it had much more to do with like the weird feudal system of the Brandenburg part being associated with the Holy Roman Empire than the lack of power. Prussia was already a you know, rising power at this point. Now, it, it definitely wasn't, like, as powerful as, like, a, you know, the UK or Russia or France um, at this point, but it was still, uh, you know, Spain. Uh, it, it was still a powerhouse, though. He expanded it to a major power. Known as a soldier and a philosopher, his reign simultaneously encompassed refinement and brutality. 
demonstrating both the splendor and slaughter of the Enlightenment. Yet his first battle was not against the Habsburgs or France, but rather his own dad. Frederick's father, Frederick William, was known as the Soldier King. Living in a sparse militaristic fashion, he despised anything he considered ostentatious or effeminate. In fact, Based. his first act upon becoming the king in Prussia and the elector of Brandenburg was to sell his own father's jewels, horses, and fine furnishings. While many German princes used the treasury as their personal party fund, Frederick William instead pursued a conservative economic policy, curtailing state spending and battling corruption. Which was a wise thing overall, but many of the unnecessary expenses he eliminated included patronage of the arts, literature, and science. Like so the arts, I'm, I'm kind of iffy on. Patronage of the arts, literature, and science. So again, the arts, I'm kind of iffy on, like whether you can consider that important or not. I understand like there's, there's some important aspects to art, right? Um, I can kind of see why a lot of people consider that, you know, important. But when it comes to literature and science, I think those are definitely things you need to be spending on. Like if you're, if you're trying to build up a, you know, a military long term, right? You want the most advanced technology. You want a highly literate populace. That way they are, uh, you know, I, I guess this is literature, though, not literacy. Right. So it's just not he's not paying for people to be writing shit. Um, so that one, I guess, is kind of iffy, too. You definitely want a literate population and you definitely want a scientific population. But Like how much. Art is important to the functioning of society. I uh, I know there's like a whole group of people that, that are like hardcore into this, both on the left and the right, right? Uh, you know, not to get too political on this, but you have like the, uh, you know, they, like the whole left wing um, art movement, I guess you could call it. I don't even know what you call it. Just like, you know, your, your normal artsy people tend to be left wing. Uh, and a lot of them are very pro like patronage for the arts. And then on, on the right, you have, like, the people that are very into, ironically, like, a lot of this time period. They are, you know, basically, like, traditionalism and, like, the art of traditionalism and, like, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And they would both be very pro-art. But fr from just a practical standpoint, I don't know how important it is. But I guess you could get into the argument of the awe-inspiring nature of it is good for people to try and, like, push themselves, which would be good for the state. Yes. Like, he didn't just defund the Prussian Academy of Sciences, he closed it. But Frederick William did have one pet project, the army. So everything he saved, he poured into defense spending. He also created a new type of military draft, the Canton system that allowed Prussia to be able to recruit and train troops more efficiently and create civilian reservists that could be called upon. In that way, he doubled the size of the Prussian military to 76,000 men, making it the fourth largest army in Europe roughly the same as that of France, which had 10 times Prussia's population. Nissan's electric. Yeah, so uh, this, this is what I was talking about at the start of the video where I said, you know, he kind of basically, he put his son in a similar position to how, what Philip did with Alexander, where he creates this amazing military and his son ends up getting a lot of the credit for the success with it. Now, to be fair, you know, that's, you know, much of success is when, you know, what's the saying? It's uh, success is when, um, you know, preparedness meets opportunity. So obviously, you know, he prepared his son and then he gave his son the opportunity. But yeah, a, lo a lot of, you know, the actual like buildup was done by uh, Frederick's father, not Frederick himself, uh, that really put, you know, Prussia in this position to be a dominant power that would go on to unify Germany. Did this guy love the army? He dressed as a military officer, held meetings in rooms where he could watch troops drilling out his window, and in an additional extreme, drafted the tallest men in Not the Holy Roman some giants. Empire into a special unit of giants. In Not only the Holy Roman Empire, they actually kidnap people from other countries in order to force them into the military. There's, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was a guy from the UK who was absolutely massive. I think he was like almost eight feet tall. And they they had had pirates kidnap him or privateers I guess technically uh, kidnapped him and brought him over because uh, Frederick William had heard about this guy, had, you know heard about his like feats of strength and how huge he was and he wanted him for his possum giants and the guy didn't end up getting free until Frederick took over and got rid of the possum giants and the guy finally got to go back to England. In fact, his council was so full of soldiers, swilling beer, and smoking foot-long pipes that it was nicknamed the Tobacco Cabinet, mostly because their meeting room smelt like an airport smoking lounge. 
He also was prone to violent rages, which got worse as the years went on and had several medical conditions that kept him in constant pain. In other words, Frederick William projected an air of hypermasculinity, Calvinist piety, and frugal financial habits. And naturally, he wanted his eldest surviving son Frederick, nicknamed Fritz, to grow up to be just like him, a hyper-virile religious soldier king, to use the great instrument of Prussian military power that he'd created. Based. <laughs> now, the first six years of Fritz's life, he'd lived with his mother, and under her care, young Fritz developed what his father considered worrying habits. Fritz loved music and books. He grew incredibly close to his older sister, Wilhelmina, enjoyed poetry, philosophy, opera, and learned to play the flute. Worse than that, it was the transverse flute, recently invented in France. Oh, Frederick William hated France, and was <laughs> to fly into a rage if the country was even mentioned. The French, he said, were decadent and effeminate. Honestly, super based. <laughs> Uh, you know, as much of a loon as his father was, I tend to agree with a lot of the shit he's saying here. So imagine his consternation when Fritz, who was tutored in French and German simultaneously, took to French as his first language and struggled with his native German. <sighs> okay, all right, not a big deal. The boy Frederick William reasoned just needed to find the fun in war, you know? So for his sixth birthday, he gave him a miniature arsenal of military rifles and cannons, plus a group of boys in uniform he was supposed to order around as living toy soldiers. Ha <laughs> ha, pretty cool, eh, Fritz? Fritz? You know? Uh, see, th this is where I, I don't think you made a good decision. I feel like if you want... Uh, one, six is a little young to be doing anything, really, but... um. I guess, like, if you wanted to be a mil military man, train him in the military, right? But, yeah, I, I feel like that's, yeah, you just kind of, yeah. It's fine. It's fine. Because Frederick William would soon also shape his son more directly. For as was tradition, the next year when he turned seven, the responsibility for raising and educating Fritz transferred from his mother to his father. As you can imagine, all studies of music, philosophy, and poetry were promptly shut down. The prince would instead now have a grueling regimented schedule of Latin, religious studies. It's honestly interesting how much like he would have been learning by the point he's only seven years old and he's like learning about philosophy and how to play all these instruments and all of this stuff. Right? Like that's a pretty in-depth education for only being seven. And also it's kind of funny that his dad wants to teach him Latin. But doesn't like the French when the French is like a language descended from Latin. Ancient classics, modern political history, and military subjects, conducted largely by military officers. But even there, Fritz found allies. His Latin tutor was sympathetic to his clearly bright charge, and not only procured him a flute, but helped him amass a secret library of 3,000 books covering poetry, Enlightenment philosophy, and art. Fritz also visited a nearby court in Saxony, which gave him a glimpse of a freer life than he'd had. Yet as Frederick grew into a teenager, Frederick William became increasingly furious over his heir, who he considered effeminate, incompetent, and irreligious, as it was increasingly clear that Fritz was an agnostic. I mean, the incompetent part is obviously not true, but uh, the other two, I mean, yeah. So he responded with a campaign of abuse. Frederick at William least at this point son, in his life. Screaming at him in front of soldiers, he burned books and artwork he found and assaulted him in public. He would strike young Frederick for sleeping in and being late for drill or for being unsure on horseback. Once, he beat him with a cane for wearing a pair of gloves when it was cold. If I had disgraced my father so, he once told Fritz, I would have killed myself. <laughs> then, when Fritz was 16 and formed an intimate relationship with one of his father's pages, Frederick William had the young man sent to a border posting and beat his son again, calling him a sodomite. Now, a quick aside here. The language surrounding Frederick's sexuality can be a hot-button topic among historians. Not whether he was gay. He clearly was attracted to men, preferred male partners, and commissioned art with homoerotic themes. The debate is more about terminology. Whether labels like gay are imposing a modern idea of sexuality on a very different time and culture. But let's be honest, in history, it's already common to use a ton of terms like feudalism or democracy to describe things that existed but didn't yet have labels, and queer people existed then as they always have. So it, what the? <laughs> I mean, if he likes dudes, it's pretty gay. Like, I don't understand why the fucking. 
the the hang up on the terms here? Is it people that are like, you know, because maybe he's bisexual? Is that is that the hang up? I don't really get it. Like, it, it's oh my god, whatever. So with all that in mind, Frederick was gay, and his sexuality definitely made it dangerous for him to live under Frederick William. At this point, he had only one hope to escape his father, a double marriage. See, his mother had been planning to marry his sister, Wilhelmina, and him to the children of her brother, George II of England. Fritz was all about this. He could go to England, which was far freer than Prussia. And look, if he had to get married to get away from his father, that was a small price. But... Yeah, far freer than Prussia does not mean pro-gay. Um, you know, at this point in European history, I, they're not really anywhere is, is pro-LGBT whatever. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know how well that's going to help you. ...fell apart due to intrigue and shifts in alliances, he plunged into despair. That was when Kata, his friend, tutor, and likely lover, agreed to help him escape. They would slip away while touring the Holy Roman Empire and flee together to England, though they were caught almost immediately and thrown into prison. Given both were military officers, Frederick William charged them with treason and seriously considered having Fritz executed, but that put him on rocky legal ground with the rest of the empire. So in the end, his punishment was to watch Kata die. After Okay, so this, this part is like very disingenuous in how it's framed. Right, he's framing this as if they're just two gay lovers that were trying to run away to like live a you know happy gay life. Um, that is not at all what happened. Okay, so his father had been beating him and beating him and beating him, and eventually he got sick of it and he wanted to leave. And he went and confided in his friend, and his friend tried to convince him not to leave because he knew what his father's reaction would be, and he kept convincing him until he did leave with him. And then he, you know, they ended up getting caught, like he says here, but. The framing of this is, like, way, way disingenuous. Frederick made a deal with his father. In return for a pardon and getting to stay crown prince, he submitted to an even more grueling and austere routine of tutors. He also swore to be a good Protestant and agreed to marry. So, he entered an engagement with Elizabeth Christine, a Protestant cousin of the Habsburg line. Though Frederick was despondent over this choice, and swearing that even friendship between them was impossible, he threatened suicide, however still had no choice in the marriage. But he knew the only way out was through. Frederick wept upon meeting her, and on their wedding night, loitered in their bedroom for an hour before abruptly leaving to stroll the grounds until dawn. But no matter, he was safe. He was free, and he only needed to wait until the soldier king died, and when he took power, he would never be beaten again. For in a surprise to all, Frederick William's tutelage had taken root, and his son would be a warrior king like Prussia had never seen. And while we wait to find out what happens to Frederick next time, I say we go make a meal fit for a king. Perfect scripted timing as per usual, Hello is Fresh. This... I am starving. Is there continued work on the sustainability? Oh, okay, so the rest of this is just an ad. Um, yeah, go check out Hello Fresh. Go check out, I'm sure he's got a link in his thing. Um, so yeah, I... I I, I don't know too much about the gay stuff, but, like, I, I'm kind of questioning it just because, like, I, I know I made the joke about him liking French and therefore he's gay, but um, I, I kind of question it just because of how much I do know that he framed very disingenuously to really drive home the gay point. Um, and... Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to look more into that because, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, maybe, maybe it's true, but just the way he was, like, very disingenuously framing other stuff, you know, maybe he'll get to that in his lies and omissions because he does the, the videos at the end where he corrects himself. But, yeah, that was definitely iffy. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.